Thank you. This is an impressive group. Are we good on the mobile mic here? Everybody can hear me fine? So um, I, I listed this as a few big picture questions, and I oversold it because I only have two. So uh, the first question I would like to talk about and spend actually most of the time on, this one is business. The second question is a little more personal. But the first question is, what is your company's next transformation? One of the things that I discovered when I was running a technology company back in the 90s is that if I did not take a step back every, at least every six months to look at the landscape, how things were changing so dramatically in the marketplace, particularly in the technology world, and if I didn't see a fundamental shift, I was missing something. Sometimes we have our heads down and, and we're just working through everything in the company and, and that's fine but we may miss things. So I'm gonna uh, relate an Olympic anecdote, and I have told this story before, but it relates, I think, fairly well. So one of the things we wanted to do as part of the Olympics, both Mitt and myself, was experience a few of the events ourselves to understand them from the athlete's point of view. So one of the things I decided to do was try the skeleton. And the skeleton is where you go down the bobsled track, you're on your stomach, you're going head first, your face is about two inches off the ice, and the first time you go down, you go about 60 miles an hour. And if you can imagine, you're going 60 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, there is a 90 degree left hand turn. 90 degrees going 60, if you can imagine. So, we go up there with some friends, they give me a little bit of training, they shoulder pads, helmet, and the training is they said, you don't have a clue what you're doing. <laughs> so just put your head down, look at the ice, and pretend you're a sack of potatoes, which means don't move, because you'll just mess it up. So I get on the track, and the butterflies are going. I mean, I, I, I'm an adventurous guy, but I was scared. So I'm on the track lying there, and then they give me a push. And then you immediately, there's this big drop to just, it's just like being shot out of a cannon. You go zero to 60 in like three seconds. It's unbelievable. And so, as I'm going, I feel I have mixed emotions. Fear and terror. <laughs> and then I come to the first left-hand turn, and I hit the wall, and then I ricochet off and hit the other side, and, and then finally I'm, I'm back on the track, and then the next turn comes. And there are 15 <coughs> turns down, so it was the longest 60 seconds of my life. And I get down to the bottom, and there's an Olympian, a skeleton athlete from uh, Turkey, and he helps because his sleds are heavy. They're like 90 pounds. And so he helps me pull the sled out, and I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> and he said, yes, if you want to try it. He said, lift your head up so you can see where you're going, not too much so you don't get the weight too far back. And when you're coming down the track, when you see that first left-hand turn, turn your head to the left. And it will shift your weight just enough to steer you through the form. I said, okay, great, I'll try it again. So we go back up to the top. This time, I have my head up and I have a completely different perspective of everything. Before it was just this ice board two inches in front of my face. This time, I can see everything. And so, get shot down, I, this time I can see the drop, and here comes that first left-hand turn. Now you're going 60, and so you have to react a little bit in advance, so I turn my head to the left, whoosh, right through the corner. I didn't touch a side. Wow, that was great. Except then I was going even faster. <laughs> <laughs> and I go down and just have pretty much a clean run and, until I get turns 13, 14, and 15, the big turns at the end, and I actually have a picture I should have brought it where you're just kind of on this <coughs> vertical wall and you're just hanging there. I got a little too high on the thing and kind of crashed a little bit, but I had a great run such that I went again. Now, I haven't been back to the track then. I, I, again, I'm, I'm trying to get up the nerve to do it again. But one of the things that that illustrates for me is our perspective. So many times in our businesses, or in our lives for that matter, we can get so focused on the day-to-day -day activities that we miss the big picture. What's the next transformation? In my mind, trend, transformations, 
create value. You can be going on day to day, and, and most of you, you start your business because you see a need in a marketplace, and you say, I'm gonna do something different, I'm gonna transform that marketplace, I'm gonna do this in this way. And that's fine, <clears throat> except for if, if we don't actively look for transformations, then we're gonna miss something. And I'll talk about that, ways to do that. So one transformation I'd like to talk about is the Olympics. So Min and I, well, Min, Min signed up, it, you can probably recall the bribery scandal where there were scholarships and everything else, that's what they talked about, but then they got to the meat of the matter and there's $130,000 in bribes that were paid to different individuals from around the world. So it was, it was horrible behavior of, of bribery to, to win the games, win the right to hold the games, but we didn't need to do it. So we arrived on the scene. This is early 1999. Mitt and I get there, and we say, okay, what's the situation? Well, these are some of the things we faced at that point in time. Right down the hall, we had the executives, and right down the hall, guess who had a big office? The Justice Department. All kinds of boxes. And they were determining whether or not they were going to indict us, the organizing committee. They indict us, we're out of business. So that's one element. The second element is our people were accosted by the, by the media. As soon as they walk out of the building, the press, because they're trying to find stories and dig, and people were, individual employees were afraid they were going to be indicted. We had a silo mentality. Now, in the Olympics, it's very different. Most companies, you have five, six, seven functions. We have 42. And for example, one of those functions was our technology function, a $300 million budget. So it was a very broad area, and there had been this mentality that knowledge is power. And I want more power, so I'm not gonna share knowledge with anybody else, because if I do, I'm sharing my power and I'm giving up my position. So nobody would talk to anybody else. It was un and it was competitive, and okay, I get ahead by stepping on somebody else. The other thing is we had, we discovered we had a $400 million budget deficit. And you'd say, well, go raise more money from sponsors. Well, one of our sponsors was John Hancock. And the CEO of John Hancock, David Delisandro, was quoted on the front page of the Wall Street Journal as saying, any CEO who signs up to be an Olympic sponsor deserves to be fired. So that was our fundraising department. <laughs> And then we get there and we say, okay, where's, so I show up and I say, where's our operational fund? And I get a big blank stare. This is three years before the games and there's nothing, nothing, zero. So we have to start from scratch. And this is one, probably the biggest logistical thing, uh, effort you put on in the world. We had 220 people at that point in time at games time, including contractors and volunteers, 50,000. So three years to scale from 220 to 50,000. So those are the things we faced. And so obviously we needed a complete transformation of the organization. And fortunately, Mitt is not only as good as he, you think he is, he's better. A remarkable leader. And so we did several things to completely transform that organization. Number one is he did a fantastic job of changing the culture. He told people that, okay, and, and we did this, is I said, you know what, Kathy, she was my head of sport. I said, your job is to make Grant successful. And Grant was the new construction. And I said, because people have thought, okay, it's just my job. We changed everything from silo to teams. It took us about a year. And there were some people that didn't embrace it and they didn't end up staying in the organization. But we changed individual to team completely. Uh, we had a culture of, it, there was lavish spending. So we had a board of 50 people, if you can imagine. Talk about oversight. Um, and when they'd have board meetings, there were these lavish lunches and flowers and everything and things like that. So the first board meeting when Mint's in charge, it's Domino's Pizza and it's a dollar a slice, because you know you could buy a pizza for five bucks, cut it into eight slices, and make three dollars a pizza. A pizza. 
and actually he's the biggest cheapskate. <laughs> Don't tell the people in the theaters here, but he pops his own popcorn to go to movies because it's such a ripoff to buy it. <laughs> Literally, I mean it's true. But he changed the entire culture to focus on our resources are very precious. Every penny matters. And then the other one was operational excellence. We told people, you're accountable, you're responsible, and, and for the Olympics, we had 37,000 milestones that we documented. We were so well prepared. It's interesting because the International Olympic Committee has asked me to go to various countries to help them prepare for the games. I remember going to Torino, Italy, and 10 months before the games, and I knew they were going to fail. It was horrible. And, and you could, all the employees knew it, they weren't prepared. At our games, we were so detail-oriented, focused on every aspect, we knew every element. We knew we were going to succeed. And so I went into MIT uh, the August before our games, and I said, MIT, it looks like we're going we're to hit this one out of the park. Our operations are ready. It looks like we're going to generate a profit, which most Olympics don't. London, by the way, just lost $35 billion, so she's going to lose $50 billion. Um, we made $100 million. So I went in it, and he said, that's great, but just don't tell anybody, because he's really good at managing expectations. If we can barely pull this off, it's a success. Well, the next time I remember talking to him is on the phone, as he's driving past the Pentagon four months before our games, right after it had been hit on 9-11. He was there in D.C. And obviously we say, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to host the world? And so uh, some of my best friends were the Secret Service, the FBI, FEMA, and all those guys, and did a fabulous job and, and pulled it off. And I remember being there in closing ceremonies and watching us on the top of the Stadium with Mitt and the governor, and we were watching the fireworks. And just thinking that, what a transformation. From a brand of being uh, described in the late Jay Leno late night shows as the bribery capital of the world. And in fact, Mitt and I went to Sydney for the games in four hours. And we had our slot shirts on our Salt Lake Organizing Committee shirts on, going through the crowd as the torch is coming into Sydney. And as we're going through the crowd, people recognize our shirts and they say, hey, he's from Salt Lake, where I did. <laughs> that was our brand <laughs> three years before the games. And then after the games, thinking, standing there on top of Bryce Echo Stadium and seeing and recognizing this wonderful transformation based on vision, <coughs> capability, teamwork. And then we go from, <clears throat> I just want to read a few headlines of a few newspapers. This is my Olympic journal. <clears throat> so some of the headlines before the games, these were like the New York Times, Washington Post, um, <clears throat> biggest scandal ever to hit the Olympics. Foley scandal leads to resignation. Olympic shame. After the games, this is what the headline said. The little city that could did. 2002 Olympics, light the fire within, which was our motto. Light the fire within, inspire, do something better. Basking in the Olympic spirit. Unbelievable games. Then Dick Ebersole, the chairman of NBC Sports, said the Salt Lake Games are far and away the most successful Olympics, summer or winter, in history. Jean-Claude Keeley, three-time Olympic gold medalist and big person in the Olympic movement, said, Salt Lake, we will always remember you. These were perfect games. And so that's now the legacy that we have uh, around the world. It's a different brand from bribery to great games. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about transformations and what's going on in the world today. I have here, as all of you do, a connection to the entire world. Data that's unbelievably accessible. Now, that didn't exist 10 years ago. And I, I want to do an analogy. I love studying science and what's going on in, in, in the world. When we think of our 
I, I'm going to do a comparison to this, but when we think of neurons and brains, so the, the roundworm has 300 neurons. But with those neurons, it has 5,000 connections because different neurons, they, they network in their connections. In our brains, we have about 85 to 100 billion neurons. Each neuron has between 10,000 and 100,000 connections. And just think of the network. And those connections coming out of the neuron is something called an axon. And those are the connector, connectors. If you took all of your axons in your brain and put them end to end, how far do you think you would go? Any rough guesses? Rough guesses. Nobody wants to be embarrassed. Around the world, <laughs> 10 times. Around the world, four and a half times. Just inside your brain. I mean, it's almost incomprehensible. The network and the power that we have here. And so what's happened is that intelligence works from all those interconnectivity of all these neurons. The similar thing has happened through in the world because you look at our history and you say, okay, there wasn't a lot of progression, but what are the things that change the progression? It's really collective knowledge and co collaboration. So we go back to, well, where did it start? Well, it started in 1455 with the Gutenberg Press. So now you could put down knowledge and it actually gets disseminated out there. And then you get different discoveries of uh, Faraday, Maxwell, in terms of EM waves and uh, in 1875, Bell, the invention of the telephone. So now people can talk real time and not having uh, to wait for things to happen. Hertz, the transmission of EM waves in 1880. Farnsworth, 1927, television. Um, but remarkably about each one of those, most of them are unilateral. They go out, they broadcast either a book or a television or radio. But then things started to change. In 1947, Shockley, Bertain, and Bardeen invent transistor, which laid the foundation to modern technology. And you start to see these technologies build upon each other. And then finally, the internet, October 29, 18, or 1969, ARPANET sent its first message from UCLA to the Stanford Research Institute. And now we have something where this, <coughs> comparable to our brain, we now have a global neural network where you have billions of people connected instantaneously and you have a network. So now we have a completely different dynamic in our world today where people, instead of starting from scratch on a particular specialized piece of science that they're working on, instantaneously have access to all the previous work that's been done. They can collaborate bilaterally with other people out there. And so now there's this explosion of transformations that are going on, and it's only accelerating. That's the world we live in today, a global neural network. And so some of the things that are happening, one very important to me is they're studying anti-aging. <laughs> and so there's a, a protein in our bodies called uh, sirtuin that as you age, disappears. Well, now they're looking at being able to replace that. Um, or um, at the end of your uh, chromosomes, at, they get a little frayed. And over time, as they divide, they diminish. And when you get old, they're just kind of weak. And now they're finding ways to protect those and insulate those. And they've done successful experiments in, in uh, rats. That's what's going on today, anti-aging. And I'm just hoping that medical technology stays far ahead of my own personal medical needs. That's it. But the things that they're doing, uh, graphene, the substance of the future, and we've had silicon for so long, uh, graphene is one molecule thick. And they're fabricating it and manipulating it in, in ways today. So we're seeing these transformations in almost every field of discovery. And so what is it that we're doing in our companies to address transformation? Because if we don't move, 
things will pass us by. So when I think of transformations, the first thing I think of in a company is I would say, are you active or passive about transformations? Is it an active part of your DNA and your culture in your organization? And there are several areas where you could have transformations. One of the first ones, the obvious one, is the market. What's going on in my marketplace today differently than it was six months ago? What are the competitors doing? Or what are my consumers needing that I, I wasn't aware of? Because they're shifting in their sophistication and their needs and their capabilities. What's shifting in the marketplace that I need to be aware of and, and focus on? That's one great transformation is understanding then, okay, how do I need to morph my product over time because it's going to shift. Uh, another transformation, and, and these are things that we've seen in, in many of our companies that we work with, is saying, uh, what about my uh, sales organization? How effective are they today? How can I transform my sales organization so they get better rewards, they feel better about their jobs, and they're more productive? There are all kinds of tools out there and capabilities out there and people who can advise you on transformation. What about culture? One of the organizations I've worked with in the past had a culture of, well, we're kind of new and we're kind of hip and, and all this stuff, but it was a lack of discipline. And so their transformation of their culture is, okay, we can still have fun and be hip and everything, but we have to have a culture of discipline. We have to have a culture of accountability, or else we'll be out of business. And so you can look at cultural shifts within your organization and and see how they could be transformative to the organization. So the um, so that's that's question one, and, and I I would ask you, and, and you can actually structure this. Some of this is you just have to take the time to think about it. But I like the notion of structured creativity, where periodically, every six months, you and your management team take a retreat, and and and. Typically, people talk about retreats, but a big part of that agenda is what are the transformations we need to make in the company? Because as you make those transformations, you create value. What's going on in the marketplace? Maybe you bring in an outside advisor who's an expert in marketing or in sales who could, who could help <coughs> advise you and help you through that structured creativity. But uh, getting out there, thinking globally, thinking big picture, what's next? The second question that I'd like to talk about briefly. Now this one's a little more personal. Um, and I apologize if, um, if this doesn't quite fit with some of you. But um, I heard a question a while ago that has given me a lot of deep thought. And as I think of transformations, the first place I need a transformation is me. I, I need to do better. Um, and the question is, how do you want to be remembered? It's not after you die. That's one of the things. But how do you want to be remembered next year when people think about you? What is it? What's your brand? Who are you? So um, I want to flip kind of the Olympic experience on its head a little bit because I, I would happen to be part of a good organization and good people and everything else. And that allowed me um, to have some identity associated with that. And I was just one of, of many very capable people. So this is my, I don't know, put something together on the Olympics, which has all the newspaper articles and everything. But um, while people might identify my Olympic experience, with me a lot, there's something very uh, different that happened during that experience. And I want to, it's a little personal, but I want to share it with you. This was March 3rd, 2000. So I'd been at the Olympics one year, and we were working like crazy. We we're just starting to dig out of the deep hole and starting to feel a little bit of progress. <coughs> um, this has been the most difficult week of my life. Last Sunday, Michael, my son, was diagnosed with cancer. He's 18 years old. 
I didn't think, I don't think I've ever, ever experienced anything so traumatic before. It is now Friday and I'm sitting here in the hospital awaiting the results of the gallium scan, which will indicate the staging of his cancer. It is very difficult waiting for the results of this final test. They found Mike's chest cavity filled with fluid, which was the first thing they had to deal with. Actually, I was in the room, couldn't put him under anesthesia, cut through his rib cage and, and drained his chest. The tumor filled a great deal of his chest, including surrounding the heart, and was pressing on his windpipe, causing his cough. This put him in a very delicate situation. They decided to wait until Wednesday for the surgery to do the biopsy. They took Mike in late Wednesday afternoon. The anesthesiologist met with us and said that given that the tumor was pressing against the air passages and that his lung had recently recovered, that the surgery was quite risky because his breathing could shut down. He would have to be operated on sitting up because of these risks. In fact, he said that several others had passed on the anesthesia because of the risk. After Mike came home, Jennifer, my wife, and I became his nursing kid, flushing his lines, he had central lines, twice a day, giving him his meds, and I would give him his shots to boost his immunity counts. I became somewhat skilled at giving shots while I was in Bolivia, and I still have the technique. One day, Mike had over 20 pills to take in one day. After coming home, Mike was very thin, continued to lose weight, he's about six feet tall, and continued to lose weight to the point that he got down to 126 pounds and was so thin that his eyes became hollow and his voice changed because he had a hard time breathing. He had to take a big breath just to say something. Now here's the remark. All throughout this, Mike was a great trooper and didn't complain at all. In fact, when Mike was at Primary Children's Hospital in the cancer ward, um, he didn't complain. He'd get in his wheelchair every day and have all the IV poles hooked up to him and he'd go visit his little buddies in the cancer room. Now here's a guy, very good looking kid, who in high school was all about himself, kind of an egomaniac, like most teenagers, right? And he was, that's what it was. Quite a transformation with him. And he then changed his attitude. He's now the most kind, thoughtful person. And so when I, and, and he visited his little buddies, and his little buddy Alec, who was four years old, had leukemia, wouldn't talk to anybody but his mom and me. Now, Alec didn't make it. In fact, out of all of his buddies, he might be one other person. <coughs> now, one other thing. One of the amazing things has been Jennifer. She has consistently been upbeat, particularly around Mike. She knows she has to lift him up, and she's done a wonderful job. So when I think about the Olympics, and I think about being remembered for the work I do, I think of instead something totally different. I think of my wife, who was a ray of sunshine in the worst circumstances possible. I mean, we. We'd stayed up at the hospital all night. Mike didn't want to be alone. She'd stay up there one night. I'd be work go up there and spend the next night. But she was unbelievable. She just is a ray of sunshine in everybody's life. Mike now is the most kind, compassionate person. One of the, all the grandkids, we have eight grandkids. They don't go to grandma or grandpa or their parents. They go to Mike. And so, when, when I think about that, I say, how do we want to be remembered as individuals? And I, I just want to ask a few questions on that. And I try to work on this all the time and, and do better. Um, do I, am I a positive person? Do I want to be remembered as somebody positive and uplifting or a curmudgeon? Nobody likes to be around a curmudgeon, and I've had my curmudgeon moments. Do I want to be fair or greedy? Or even generous? 
do I want to be known as an obsessive talker or a careful listener? Do I want to be remembered as somebody that raises people up or pulls them down? My wife is the best at raising people up. Do I want to be the claimer of credit or the giver of credit? Do I want to be consistently reliable or the guy that you can't count on? Um, do I want to be remembered as somebody who is courageous in facing challenges? And one of the most important things, do I want to be remembered as unfailingly kind to my spouse and other people? And so as we go about all this stuff, in work and everything else, you're developing your own brand of how people think about you, remember you. And yes, it's important for our companies to be successful, but I think there are other things that we should take some time, take a step back, just like I said, okay, what's the transformation we want to do in our company? And, and we periodically step back and say, where do we need to go next with that? It's the same thing about ourselves. What's the next transformation you need to make in your life? And that's something I try to do not, not as well as I should. And one of the things we try to do in the Olympics is we try to do uh, something called light the fire within. And so it was trying to encourage the notion that within each of us we can do better. And so we tried to be inspirational to kids watching these athletes achieve unbelievable things. And so we had this, everything you saw was light the fire within, and we had this torch that had glass on the top so you could see the fire within the flame. You see the cauldron at the University of Utah. It's the same thing, light the fire within. That's, that's our theme. And so I would just encourage us to think of, okay, how can we do better and light the fire within each of us? Uh, the Olympics was a wonderful experience. I feel grateful that I was pulled into that. When they first asked me to join them, I turned them down and said, you're looking for somebody semi-suicidal. <laughs> but it helped transform me in terms of understanding how to work with organizations. In fact, I was in Vancouver uh, for the Olympics, and, and Nick was there. And we saw Beth, Beth White, who had run our main media center here in, in Salt Lake City, and she was helping Vancouver. And she said something very interesting. She said, and, and I see this every time I go to the Olympics, I've been seven now, and see members of our team. And they said, there was nothing like Salt Lake City. The team, the feeling, the confidence, no games has ever been like that. And so I would encourage you to think about your organizations. What's the next transformation or transformations? And then within each of us, personal transformations, how do you want to be remembered? Thank you for your time. So we do have a few minutes for questions. There are any. You can ask about the net. So while we uh, go to the question phase, why don't you also give us some feedback for the So you were uh, crucial with, uh, with the Utah Thunder Bucks. It's been running for the past 2003. Uh, talk about your perception <coughs> a decade later of what that has done, or not. Well, uh, I was in a meeting with an individual from Sequoia, who were co-investors in the deal. And that individual partner from Sequoia said, Utah is on fire. And we all know that. We see it every day. It's, it's absolutely miraculous what's going on in Utah. It's so fun to see this. And we're the envy of the country in, in many respects. And when I look a decade back, yes, there were some things going on and some things getting started. But one of the things that was missing was capital. And when you bring capital to wonderful, capable entrepreneurs and great ideas, you can see a miraculous explosion, and that's what's happened here. And so even though there are other sources of capital and things like that, 
I felt like we needed as much capital as possible in the state. And so the fund of funds uh, was very instrumental in that and I think helped ignite and helped lay the foundation to this really superb economic explosion that's happening here in Utah. So I think it was a fabulous idea. And you can look at it, okay, what did the fund of funds get as a return per se on its fund? But the multiplier effect in our community has just been, in my opinion, the standard. So uh, from a business perspective, whether it was bank capital or source of capital, can you talk to us about things that uh, or an experience that was you were the most proud of with a company and then the biggest disaster that you've had as a as an investor. So both ends of the spectrum as you as you've been an investor. Well the disasters are really easy. I got lots of those. <laughs> um, I, I think well and I don't want to blame it on the recession, but um, there were some things that happened. We invested in a company called Digital Bridge. Had a lot of promise here in Utah, but the recession hit, funding dried up, and it went bankrupt. And that's, that's tough. You see people laid off and things like that. It's just really hard. And, and I say, could we have done anything differently? I don't think so. It, the, the tragedies are where you say you could have done something differently and you didn't, and then there was a failure. I, I can't recall any of those. I'm sure I've got them. Um, and, and then organizational successes. Uh, they come in different types. Obviously, one of the biggest successes in the state of Utah is Amish. And it was absolutely a delight seeing that company. And talk about transformation. We went from collecting a little bit of data here and there called Superstats in the early years. But then seeing it transform several times and seeing the capability of the management team grow because these are guys just as you know fresh out of college hadn't really had a job before and here they are growing so i like to see people grow and organizations grow and then along with them the market and then the transformations from gathering some data to analytics to a marketing company to a transformative marketing company for people on their, on their websites and then uh, seeing the company go public successfully, weathering the downturn, and then uh, a sale to uh, Adobe. The one tragedy in Omnitra is that we shouldn't have sold it. Um, but the threat was Google. Google Analytics had a free product, and you say, how do you compete against free? And so there was always, even though Omnitra, there were six companies that were kind of equal in size, and we had a game over strategy. We're just going to win the market. We're going to invest in sales and technology and be the best out there. And, and we did that. And so we won, but there was one free competitor out there, and Google's not something to be trifled with. Well, it turns out that that division of, of Adobe now is over a billion dollars and very successful, which we, is great to see. But that's that's my one regret with on the generations. Yes? With regard to, you spoke a lot about culture and, and, and uh, collaboration and technology and things like that. What, what influence has systems had in your transformations? Oh, <laughs> systems? Uh, in my mind, uh, it, and I'll, I'll put it into technology companies and non-technology companies. In my mind, product leadership is the foundation of everything. You've got to have the best product. And so when it comes to systems, like Imagine Learning, with those guys, uh, they absolutely have the best technology. They've made huge investments in it to say, we want to be better than anybody else. And, and in my mind, uh, in technology companies, that's where you have to be. You have to make the investments to be the market leader and people can see that. Because then it enables the salespeople and marketing people to be far more successful. And so systems in that, from that perspective, absolutely crucial. The other thing is, in systems on, on in non-technology companies, I believe in giving people our best tools to succeed. And that's one of the transformations, is what tools do you give them, whether it's a structure of meetings or whether it's technology tools, it's, you always want to have the best tools because they lead to more effective transformations. Yes? Um, as you work with different companies in their sales uh, divisions or 
portfolio companies, whether it's Bain or Sorosin, what's the next transformation that you see in the sales world uh, with all of these companies? <coughs> That's a great question. Um, I think um, salespeople are a, a unique breed of cat, as we all know. Uh, and they're, they have special skills that the rest of us don't, don't have. And the question is, how best to harness those skills to provide them the training they need and to provide them the platform they need? And so you've got all these sales management techniques that are out there and tracking and, and uh, <coughs> sales force and, and different things like that. To me, I think the, the, the best transformation for a sales force is having the best product, the best marketing plan that ties to how you're going to reach your customers. And then within the sales team, having them completely integrated into that whole ecosystem. They're not the salesperson out here trying to do something. It's part of the whole ecosystem out there. Um, and then providing them the tools. Now, I don't see that as revolutionary. I think that's kind of fundamental blocking and tackling. Um, but uh, Salesforce productivity is, is, is it's the lifeblood of any company. You kind of start with a great product, and then you add on sales, and then you build a brand over time. And to the extent you build that brand, then your sales or your sales job gets gets a lot easier. So that's a pretty weak answer to a good question. Anyway, next question. Yes. Question about the importance of the Olympics when they silos and developing teamwork. How do you incentivize teamwork and at the same time maintain personal accountability? So, um, with the teamwork, um, it started with me. So the people that, and I heard, never recommend this, but I had 10 direct reports because we had 42 functions. It was just too hard to, I, that's too many direct reports. But I meet with them one on one every week and I had a coaching session with them. But I said, you know what my job is? It's to make you successful. That's my job. If I make you successful, we're going to be fine. Now, can you do the same thing? And, and so that's a total mind shift for people to say, whoa, I thought you were in your job to make yourself successful. No, my job is to make you successful. Now, your job is to make these other people successful that you work with. And so, in my weekly coaching sessions with them, I would say, okay, what have you done <coughs> towards that this week? And sometimes they'd come in and, and they'd say, oh man, Kathy would come in and say, Grant's a problem. And I've got this problem, can you work it out? And usually, before she finished her question or her statement, I knew what the answer was, I knew what the three alternatives were. And rather than tell her, I'd coach her through it and say, well, why don't you go to Grant? And why don't you talk to, her, to him and explore these alternatives and come back to me with an answer? So part of our job is to coach people and train them. The easiest answer is to just give an answer and say, go do this. The long-term solution, because at games time, 99% of what we did was at the venues. I, I can't solve any problems or something like that. So you train the people. And so I would coach and train every one of my people every week. And if I ever saw any unusual behaviors, then we address that. In terms of accountability, um, they all had their personal objectives, 37,000 of them that we spread around. But everybody knew that, okay, my job is to get these successful, but I have this interrelationship here. I need to help that person be successful as well. They knew a lot of these goals were matrixed. They did have responsibility for the primary so. Yes? <clears throat> kind of a two-parter. I'm just curious about the Olympics. Um, in, your seat, in your senior team, um, how many of those people did you bring in that you already knew? How many were you know, fresh hires and how many were sort of left over? And then secondly, um, how do you motivate these people when it's obviously a temporary job and, and it's just, you know, you know there's, a, there's a time limit on that. Um, you know, like stuff. Yeah, so um, the, the team that we brought in, one of the things that I insisted on was that out of our 42 functions, we had one 
at least one person that had in-depth experience in the Olympics in that function. And I think sometimes we miss that in organizations. We want to, like one of the organizations I work with right now, they have a lot of young people that want to promote them. And yes. And they feel, oh, if you're going to bring somebody in on top of me, that's bad. That's totally the wrong way to look at it. Because if you have that prior experience in that function, they can train these people in their careers. Because if they're, people are generally doing the best they know how, but they don't have the skill set, they don't have the background, they don't have the training, and they'll struggle. And so the best thing is to bring in an experienced person in that can then train that team because it will help them throughout, throughout their entire career. So I believe in experience in every function, prior to the experience. And we did that in each one of our 42 functions. Uh, I would say in terms of our key management team out of the 10, there were three or four that were there that were really strong. I had to let two go. And the rest I brought in and from prior Olympic experience. And then the first thing you do when you interview them, you say, OK, guess what? We're going to fire you on April 1st, 2002. You're going to have to find a new job. But what was interesting about that is this was cause related. People said, I want to be part of a special class. And it became even more important after 9 11 to really unify the country and so many respects the world. And that made it very special. To me, the, as much as I like Bain or Sorensen Capital, the Olympics was very unique because it was a special class. And people felt that. Yes. When is the right time for a company to introduce themselves for funding? What are the metrics that you're looking for, especially considering the social world? Well, the right time for funding is day one, right? You need somebody somewhere. <laughs> and it depends what stage you're at, because there are different organizations that fund at different stages. Like Greg is a little bit earlier than we are in a lot of cases, but we still do deals together. Now Blake's earlier than we are. And so you'll you want to it's, it's a matchmaking process. You want to find companies that invest in exactly your size and your industries. And so you have to do a little homework about that. And then as you, and as you get a little bit bigger, then for us, in, uh, we look for companies that have at least $5 million in revenue and, and hopefully a little bit more than that. Um, ideally 10, but we'll, we'll look at companies like that. But it's really a matchmaking process. And when you find a partner, remember it's like getting married. You want a partner who not only brings money, but that will be there as your back, will help you, protect you, and help you grow. That's really what you're getting as much as anything else. Yes? I was just interested in your thoughts on why the Utah Olympics were so successful. Um, you know, early on, clearly there were some financial challenges, but why were they so successful in comparison to other Olympics? from a public-private partnership perspective and uh, implementing sound business practices? Okay, and I think this is our last question. So, um, I would say, uh, number <clears throat> one is, you, you talk about a private-public partnership, this was all private. Uh, the only money we got from the outside was the federal government. And that's what people don't know. We were, we were on our own. And we had to make the, the state wasn't behind us, the city wasn't behind us, we didn't get any money. We gave the money back. And uh, so we were on our own, and we realized that. And so I, I'd say there are two or three things that were really critical to our success. Number one is that we were uh, absolutely hired the best team ever in the Olympic movement. When I hired somebody in each of those functions who had prior Olympic experience, these weren't just prior Olympic experience, these were superstars in prior Olympic experience. And in any organization, it starts with the team. And so we knew exactly what we needed to do in accreditation. Okay, here are all the things that need to happen. Very complicated function, but we hit it out of the park. Second thing is, we inspected everything. We put plans together, detailed plans, we left nothing to doubt. For example, our transportation system. We had 5,000 vehicles. And our bus system. We had hundreds and hundreds of buses to transport the media. Our team put a plan together, but I inspected every route that they would go, time, 
load unload times, parking spaces, did we have enough, and capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So we did an incredible amount of detailed inspection, and we knew when we went in, everything, every detail was covered. Third was financial discipline. Um, we had a watch every penny mentality, and that was throughout the organization, uh, and that was meant. And then I'd say, finally, we had men. It was absolutely remarkable. Just a fantastic leader. Give Fraser a huge <laughs>